Now this new trending practice of southern states exporting their undocumented immigrants to northern states has sent me down quite the mental roller coaster. And what do you know? Hey, there's room for one more person on this crazy ride. So let's slide down that suspiciously loose bar and settle in for the long show. First stop on this roller coaster, Policy Junction. You see, Trump had three major immigration policy changes. Remain in Mexico, instant deportations, and holding asylum seekers in federal custody for the entire duration of their asylum trials. Now, For a long time, America well, we just didn't have the biggest asylum problem. Immigration was largely single Mexican men coming over the border looking for work. You catch them, they willingly leave, and then they come back over the border again a few days later. No one was getting the courts involved, everything was simple, and everything was efficient for all the participating parties. Ah, <sighs> the good old days. But then 2008 happened, and the financial crisis really sent Central America downhill. This led to us getting a new tier of migrants, asylum seekers. Now these guys were not as thrilled with our whack-a-mole immigration system, and rather than leave, well, they were actually petitioning the government for a hearing to determine whether they could remain here legally as asylees. Unfortunately for immigration hawks, there was a huge problem here, specifically the Constitution. You see, during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln amended the Constitution to give certain inalienable rights to all persons in the United States. Now, these include due process rights as well as the right to a fair trial. Now, as interpreted in the Supreme Court's case of Zedvitas v. Davis, previous episode, link at the end, click on it to see what I look like when I had all my hair. Undocumented people existing within the borders of the United States qualify as people in the United States, and therefore they have certain inalienable rights, including the right to a fair trial should they choose to petition for that option. Can't kick them out unless they expressly consent to it. Now, Under Obama, America's policy for dealing with these immigrants petitioning to remain in the United States until their trial was to just sort of process their claims, give those people a court date, and then let them go. Show up or we're going to reject your asylum claim and then we're sending ICE after you guys to actually get you out of here. Now, This is considered the progressive solution. I'm not going to try to oversell you on it though, because when you start looking at its effectiveness, about 60% of the people show up to their trial. Pretty underwhelming stuff. Trump, in his first signature policy change, decided to end that catch and release policy, as he called it, and instead detain all asylum seekers for the entirety of their court proceeding. That is, of course, unless you want to sign a document saying that we can kick you out without the asylum trial. Now, this policy led to a few branching results. Starting with awkwardly and inadvertently triggering all those infamous family separations we all heard about. You see, last time America had a massive asylum seeking detention scheme was under Bill Clinton, and it was not good. We were holding a bunch of migrant children in terrible conditions. Clinton got sued, and long story short, we ended up with something called the Flores Settlement. After that settlement, it was decided that children can only be held in standard detention facilities for a few days before they get transferred into their own cute little kitty jails that we can use to lock up all the minors. Boy, is that quite a dystopian sentence to say out loud. Now, asylum teams can take years to figure out, and under Trump, we were now holding groups in detention centers for the entirety of those trials and appeals. Do the math, and uh, we're going to need to be removing those children if we're going to do this policy properly. This led to children being sent to separate facilities without their parents. Unless, of course, you want to sign this legal document saying that you're willing to leave the country on your own tuition. Now, of course, this was not the only crack to show up with this policy. The policy was incredibly expensive. I know that the government is great at spending money like there's no tomorrow, but with the price tags health and human services were paying per bed, you'd think we were detaining these people at the frickin' Ritz. 318 a night and we're running around 45,000 beds? Whew. 
know someone's getting rich off of this, and it certainly isn't me. Well, that is, unless I had invested a lot of money into private prison companies. The name of the game under this policy was Beds, and with scarcity came massive profits. We were building temporary centers in the deserts, and it was all just sort of an unsustainable and expensive mess. In 2019, even with all these temporary detention centers adding beds, the numbers became just too overwhelming and new asylum seekers had to be released to the public. Now that is where innovation number two came into play, the remain in Mexico policy. Alright, alright, so we can't keep separating families and dumping money into detaining all of these asylum seekers who are crossing the borders. What if we allowed people to exercise their due process rights to schedule a day in an American court, but then we made them wait in Mexico until the day came? When your day comes, we're going to pick you up from the border and drive you to America to face one of our judges. Now everyone shook hands on this policy and it was now the law of the land. As to be expected, the conditions in Mexico were dangerous and terrible. But no laws were found to have been broken, so that new Remain in Mexico system stayed. Now, Despite an incredibly janky paper based system, people were occasionally making it to their court cases and Americans collectively didn't really care. So this brings us to the final piece of today's puzzle for Trump's policies, instant deportations. You see, emergencies are the perfect time to start rolling back some people's rights, and at the end of Trump's presidency, he had the perfect emergency to do that, the pandemic. Alright, what if we could take away that due process right for certain persons existing in the United States? I got it! Citing the emergency declaration from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Homeland Security officials have bypassed court ordered due process protections for minors, asylum seekers, and others as they return border crosses to Mexico as quickly as possible. You see, the sort of trick that they were using was migrants taken into custody were now tallied as encounters rather than apprehensions and they are expelled from the country rather than formally deported. Now, With that final policy change, we were back to the George Bush whack-a-mole immigration days, except this time instead of having the option to apply for asylum and then refusing it, immigrants were just sort of expelled without due process rights. Basically, you want to relitigate Zidvide S. V. Davis in a national emergency with this Supreme Court? Ha, <laughs> didn't think so. If you had an existing court date, well, that date was maintained. But new asylum seekers, don't let the door hit you on the way out. So this was the system that Biden inherited when he became president. So now Biden's looking at this particularly aggressive hand that he's been dealt, and he's looking back to try to get us to the Obama era of immigration policy. Now this process has been the definition of slowly but surely. Reinstate due process rights to undocumented immigrants? Look, there's a distraction. Now the order of operations here has been particularly strange. First thing we did was axe the executive system of detaining all asylum seekers for the entirety of their asylum process. Now don't worry, we're still detaining a bunch of demographics. Single adults and unaccompanied minors? Well, we got a facility with your name on it. But if you have family here, or a family that could be split up by the Flores Agreement, or have a specific place that you need to go or live, feel free to hop out the federal government's books and hopefully show up to your eventual trial. Now, The awkward thing throughout this entire period was the other policies that were still remaining in place, specifically remain in Mexico in this instant deportation policy. Over a year later, after a dramatic court battle, the Remain in Mexico policy has been reversed. But strangely enough, the COVID policy of maintaining the ability to kick all undocumented individuals out for public safety remains on the books to this day. Now, Ironically enough, currently in the court fight, a bunch of conservatives are arguing that COVID pandemic is still so much of a public health emergency that this measure needs to stay in place. 
is not being used like it was a few years ago, but it still remains a tool that's up to the discretion of the DHS and Border Patrol to use or not use to kick people out of the country. Now this brings us to the second stop in our exploration of this issue, burdens. Now one thing that has been a constant curiosity to me is who's actually paying the cost of undocumented immigrants waiting for their asylum claims to be heard before a court. Now one of the largest complaints that you'll hear out of southern states is that they're being forced to deal with these federal issues on a state budget and state level. Now this is where you can see a pretty significant change from Donald Trump to Joe Biden regarding the asylum issue. You see, detaining tens of thousands of asylum applicants in the health and human services detention centers made this a very expensive issue, but a very expensive issue that was being paid for entirely by the federal government. With the policy return of not detaining all asylum applicants for years on end, that shift the costs off the book. Now this is where things start to get a little counterintuitive for me. You see, when I started writing this episode, I was definitely thinking that housing all these asylum seekers and taking care of all these applicants was going to be a net liability for states. But it turns out, well, time and time again, when you compare state spending on these issues versus state revenue generated by asylum seekers paying state taxes, it always comes out on the side of actually being a revenue generating issue. Now, the latest report from Rice University found that for every dollar that the Texas state government spent on public services specifically for undocumented immigrants, the state collected $1.21 in revenue. Now, of course, if you're hearing that and saying, that all sounds a bit fishy, you're not alone. I kind of agree with you. So I can tell you, after digging a little deeper, the reason that this doesn't impose a huge direct cost on the states themselves is that most of the burden of care is shifted onto nonprofits who get funding through a combination of donations and grants from their state and federal governments, as well as donations from private individuals. So it's not all states dealing with this stuff. When you cut beyond all the politics though, this leaves the state and federal divide as one of the core fighting lines for this immigration debate. For example, as a New Yorker, I'd just love to take a second to thank Ron DeSantis for shipping up a bunch of revenue generating asylum stickers. Our state taxes are wild over in New York, let's get them plugged into the system and bam. Now the unspoken argument with these different immigrant movements is that they're trying to emphasize that federal decisions are putting an adverse burden on specific border states. And interestingly enough, when you start thinking in this way, there's potential for quite a bit of agreement amongst the different parties for this specific issue. You see, liberals will argue that community-based models are being chronically under-resourced as the federal government has invested taxpayer dollars into jails and enforcement technology instead of support services, you know, the things that actually help people in the specific states. Biden, how about we take some of that detention center money and instead use it for immigrant services? Instead of making Texas and southern states foot the bill for free asylum seekers while we just pay for the detention centers that house the rest of them, let's make this sort of a A to Z federal issue. Now, the solution advocated for by southern states is similar. Hey, how about we don't do this whole federally run program because no big government, unless of course we're talking about detention centers, but instead you give us reimbursements so that we can improve our state and private programs for helping immigrants. Now in this case, positions are a little harder to pin down. You have the more mainstream senators like John Cornyn and Ted Cruz writing to the federal government to say, yo, my guy. We have so many people presenting themselves at the border and applying for asylum right now. All these NGOs tasked with taking care of them are just burning through money, and our state government, well, we're all running out of funds ourselves. Either get FEMA to start reimbursing Texas and our NGOs, or reopen all the federal government detention centers and start sending people back to Mexico again. Now, most of these conversations sort of end because the debate 
Well, it tends to include border security and the things they want to be paid back for, like ICE and building of a wall. And that leads to the Democrats hanging up. Now, this is not to be the be all end all opinion amongst southern states because while Cruz and Cornyn are definitely representing Texas in Congress, the people taxed with actually administering aid in Texas are singing a different tune. Specifically, you got Governor Greg Abbott, who is rejecting federal reimbursement for helping asylum seekers and instead, probably accidentally, advocating for a very federally managed approach to immigration. He specifically said that the federal government has the responsibility to fund the testing of anyone coming here who does have COVID, and it is ICE, not the state of Texas, who is responsible for administering those tests. So he's rejecting federal aid in protest of the decision to no longer force all asylum seekers to wait for their hearings in Mexico, and instead allow them to wait for their trial in the United States without being in a detention center. Now it's time for some ending thoughts about this whole thing for you guys to chew on. If you look at the major changes that have happened in the American immigration policy from Trump to Biden, it all really revolves around the treatment of asylum seekers. The trouble here is that unless you have a public health emergency, or unless the Supreme Court overturns the divide us v Davis, both very possible, any human in the United States property in amongst our borders has certain rights, including the right to due process. If they want to exercise an asylum claim, that's going to have to be litigated before a court at some point. Trump's solution to this problem was first federal detention, then wait in Mexico, and then use a public health emergency to block applications. Biden's solution is more release the individuals, rely on state and local government programs, and come on folks, let's all put on some elbow grease and work through all these claims. Now this change is happening in the context of increasing numbers of asylum claims. An increase in asylum claims that are being attributed either to Biden's more sympathetic policy towards asylum seekers or just the deterioration of the world at large. And that answer depends on who you're asking. I hope at large this whole episode helps some of you make sense of the southern border policy debate. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to like if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.